everybody, and welcome to Rockefeller University's Virtual Science Saturday. I am Jeannie Garbarino, Director of Rocky DU Science Outreach, and I'm the host today. Pay attention to my background photos because I'm going to share examples of past Science Saturday events through my pictures. Before getting started, I would like to thank our generous sponsors who have made Science Saturday possible. They are the Andrea C. Dracopoulos Family Science and Society Initiative, the Quadrivium Foundation, the Pacent Freeman Family, and the Steinman Family Foundation. Before I introduce you to our experts on microscopes, I'd like to tell you a bit about myself and what my job at Rockefeller is all about. As a kid, I always loved to ask questions about nature and how things worked. In fact, one of my first science memories is using the microscope kit my parents gave to me as a gift. It helped me begin to explore the world of science and once I began learning about the incredible tools that scientists can build just to answer questions about the world, I was totally hooked. From a very early age, probably since the age of many of you out there, I knew I wanted to become a scientist. While I think everyone can be a scientist in their own way, I was really lucky to get formal scientific training at Columbia University, which is a college or a university on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And I studied how molecules of fat behave inside of our cells. You might think of fat like things like butter or olive oil, but there's molecules of fat that are very important for our cells to function. And when I finished those studies, I passed a special test and I was granted an educational degree called a PhD. Getting this degree allowed me to get a new kind of science position, this time as a postdoctoral researcher at Rockefeller where I continue to study how fat molecules behave inside of cells. Over time, I realized that I was just as passionate about sharing the wonders of science as I was at doing science. And that led to my becoming a director of Rocky to Use Science Outreach at Rockefeller. This is really my dream job because I get to share all of the cool science that is going on at Rockefeller with students and teachers in New York City and beyond. Each year, my team and I run lab programs for thousands of New York City students and teachers who are involved in the K through 12 um, educational sphere. In these sessions, sometimes students spend the day with us seeing what it is like to conduct science in a lab. And during the summer, we work with high school students and college students who are paired with Rockefeller scientists to work on special research projects. You can find more about all of these programs on our Rockefeller EDU website on the Rockefeller University website. Rockefeller is a really exciting place to work. Sometimes I think about Rockefeller in terms of pop culture. Like, you know how amazing Disney World is and how all of the stories that come out of Disney and Pixar are just always so much fun? Well, that is how I feel about Rockefeller. Being on campus is like being at Disney World and learning the knowledge that our scientists create is like watching the best Pixar movie ever. At Rockefeller, we have 600 scientists working in 70 different labs. We call the bosses of the labs principal investigators, which we often shorten to PI. That's sort of like a cool title, you know, like the PI. And as the boss of the lab, the PI runs a team of staff, like research technicians and trainees, like graduate students and postdocs. I was a postdoc, so I was a trainee under a boss that was called a PI. Science is truly a huge team effort. Through these efforts, we study almost every disease or health condition you can think of and are guided by our motto, science for the benefit of humanity. So I told you about the players in the research laboratory, but while each scientist is an expert in their field, no scientist can be an expert in everything. And often a scientist from a lab needs cutting edge high-tech, complex equipment to help with their research. So at Rockefeller, resource centers have been set up to house specialized equipment and experts have been hired to help scientists with their investigations. And most of the time, the experts are scientists themselves. Resource centers are super important for supporting science research. And this morning, you're going to meet the specialists who run two microscope centers. I bet many of you have seen a microscope and maybe even operated one. Maybe you got a gift from someone who cared about you the way I did uh, when, when I got a microscope present from my family. As you can imagine, microscopes are powerful tools because they enable scientists to discover things about our world 
that we cannot see with our eyes alone. When did we start using microscopes? You may not know that the first microscope was invented hundreds of years ago. Early on, scientists used microscopes to study biology, such as what are flowers and leaves made of, or what are microbes like bacteria and yeast, and what are they doing in our, in our life? But since their invention, microscopes continue to evolve. Back then, microscopes let us see cells. Today, there are microscopes that let us look inside of cells and even inside molecules to see individual atoms, which are the basic building blocks of all living things. There are also microscopes that you can put in your pocket and others that stand on the floor are taller than a person and weigh hundreds of pounds. We are going to see one of these today. And after we've heard from all of the presenters, we will take questions from the audience. We already have a list of questions that were sent in. And if you have a question, please feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to type in your question. And we'll try to get as many as we can. Okay, now I am so, so excited to, to introduce a couple of my favorite people at Rockefeller. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Allison North, a research associate professor and the senior director of the Fritz and Rita Marcus Bioimaging Resource Center. I also like to call her the queen of microscopy. And joining her is Donovan Poix, a graduate fellow um, who, is all, who does a ton of microscopy in his own work. Welcome, Allison and Donovan. I'm now turning the program over to you. Thank you so much. So good to be here with you today. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Bioimaging Resource Center. Can everyone hear me? Maybe Jeannie, you can stick a thumb up if you can hear us fine. Yeah, you're, you're coming in great. Excellent, good. So it's my pleasure to tell you today about what we do here in the Bioimaging Resource Center. And as Jeannie said, I've brought in Donovan, who's one of the scientists who uses our microscopes. We're doing something incredibly brave today. We're doing a live demo. That's a very risky thing to do with a half million dollar microscope, which tends to crash frequently. This one has quite a strong personality of its own. It also needs a little bit of tweaking, but since it was made in the UK, the engineers have not been able to get out during COVID. So just like the cooking shows, we've made some movies in advance just in case things go wrong. We're gonna hope they don't. So what we do here in the Bioimaging Center is we use optical microscopes, which are also known as light microscopes. So what I mean by that is just any microscopes which use visible wavelengths of light for the illumination. And most of the microscopes that we use here are actually fluorescence microscopes. So I want to explain quickly what fluorescence is. So certain types of molecules can undergo this process called fluorescence. And what that means is that if you shine a certain color or wavelength of light at these molecules, they can get excited into a higher energy state and then they kind of vibrate around in this higher energy state for a while, like you do if you've had too much chocolate. And then after a while, they drop back down again to their normal state. And as they do that, they release what we call a photon of light of a different color. That's the cool part. So you excite them with one color and they emit a different longer wavelength color. All right, so this is just to show you what it would look like. For example, we could excite a tube of dark colored liquid with blue light and it emits green light. Cool. Okay then. So why is this clever? Well, one thing we can do is we can use glass filters. Actually, they're generally made of hundreds of layers of coatings. These expensive little filters can cost hundreds of dollars each. And we can use these to separate out different colors of light. So now we could say have one color and then a different color and a different color all at once. How cool is that? I want to give you a little demonstration of fluorescence. We're going to see if this will work. And I've got a very, very high power UV laser pointer here, which is highly dangerous. So I'm going to warn Donovan to please not look around for the next few seconds, because we do not want to risk damaging his eyes, which we can easily do. If you look over there at that, there's a black box on the table next to the microscope. I'm going to shine this UV laser. And hopefully you can see a purple dot there. And if I move that purple dot across onto the liquid, now you can see it turned blue, okay? So this UV light is exciting a certain fluorochrome, we call it a fluorescent molecule, which then emits this blue colored light. 
Now, normally, if you were here in person, I would ask, does anybody, anyone tell me what this is? Because it's the first known fluorescent molecule that was identified back in the mid 1800s. I can tell you, your parents are probably very familiar with it. They put it in their gin. This is quinine or quinine, as they pronounce it in this country, which is found in tonic water. So that's all that's in that bottle. So anyway, that's what we can do. And the cool thing about fluorescence is, as you saw there, you get a very, very bright dot against a very black background. So it's a very high contrast technique, as we would say. If you want to see something in a microscope, you need it to be easily distinguishable against what's in the background. Contrast is very important. The other thing that's very important in microscopes is not what you all think. You're all thinking magnification. Actually, the answer is resolution. And what do I mean by resolution? I mean it's the ability to have two very closely spaced objects, but be able to perceive that they're actually two separate objects, not just one bigger object. Now, when you see the next talk about electron microscopes, you're going to say, well, my goodness, they have much better resolution than a light microscope. Why on earth would anybody bother devoting their entire life to light microscopy then anymore? Well, the answer is, we can do something very cool with light microscopes. We can image living organisms. That you can't do with an electron microscope. So each of them has their uses. So how do we image living organisms? Well, some years ago, they discovered the protein that makes a certain jellyfish called Aquaria victoria fluorescent green. The protein is known as, very originally, green fluorescent protein. So this is actually won the Nobel Prize, all this work. What they did was they isolated the DNA that encodes this green fluorescent protein. And then what we can do is we can take the DNA which encodes any protein that you're interested in looking at and following around a cell. So now what we do is we fuse, I hope you can see this, the DNA for the GFP with the DNA for the protein, and we end up with this DNA, this one strip which contains both of them. And now it's going to express it as a protein that has a little tiny green fluorescent tag. So we can do that with this GFP from, um, from jellyfish. We can also do it with different color fluorescent proteins from corals. If you want to find the coolest job in the universe, not actually genies, it's the person I heard from in Australia whose entire job is to go scuba diving at night to find different colors of fluorescent corals and then bring them up into the lab the next day. So if you like scuba diving and science, there's the job for you. So we can take this green fluorescent protein, we can tag all different parts of the cells, and that's what Donovan's going to show you. We can even tag entire green fluorescent rabbits, for example. It's completely harmless, it doesn't affect it. Or here, you can see this is from what they call the rainbow mouse, which is a mouse which has different colors of fluorescent protein and all the different neurons in its brain. Super cool. Right, so now we have these. So how do we image them? So we put them under a microscope. So here you have the kind of microscope here that we would use. This is a very fancy one, actually. This is called a super resolution microscope, which means it can give you better resolution than most light microscopes. What we have is the regular microscope stand. And then we have here this, there, this box, which looks incredibly boring, right? But it's not. Inside that box is actually a whole load of fancy lenses and mirrors. I'm showing you this, but I'm not really allowed to because of the intellectual property. So I'm just whisking it in front of your eyes. But just to say, it's really complicated. And coming into the back of the microscope, we have lasers coming in through a fiber optic cable. And then the light comes out through here, through this fancy box, and then it reaches two different cameras here on the end. These cameras can cost up to $60,000 each, by the way. They're very, very sensitive, so you can detect a single molecule of this fluorescence. We also have another laser coming into the back of the microscope, which is actually short wavelength, very high power pulse, and it's used for cutting things. So it's like a pair of scissors in the back of the microscope. We call this ablation. So we can go in and we can just cut something very precisely in the cell. And this is something that you're going to see Donovan do. So this microscope is super fast. It's super resolution. It's incredibly sensitive. And it's really exciting to use when it's working. So now we're going to pray. And I'm going to hand over at this point to Donovan who's going to take it away with the science. Hey guys, how's it going? I'm Donovan. I'm, here, I'm a graduate student here at Rockefeller University. Um, and I'm really excited to tell you about what I'm working on and, and things that we can do with the microscope here. So just like you and I, we all have trillions of cells inside our body. 
And in these cells, we have muscles. So just like your, your, just like your brain cell, your liver cell, your muscle cell, the, inside all these cells, they have little, little muscles and bones we call the cytoskeleton. And so I'm really interested in understanding how the muscle works in these cells. So using the green fluorescent protein, like I was going to mention before, we can label the cytoskeleton of the cell or the muscles of the cell. As I play the movie, you can watch these cells move around and explore its territory. So you can see some of it is squirming, squeezing its muscles, some of it is moving back, you know, some of it is protruding out. And so I'm really, really excited and really interested in understanding how, these how the cytoskeleton of the cell works. More specifically, just like you and I, um, our cells, our muscles can get cramps. So when you get cramps, you feel tired, you're less likely to move, or you don't want to work as hard. The same thing for these cells. The cells can get cramps too. And how we can watch these cells um, have cramps or watch whether they have a cramp is by this protein called zixin. So let me show you that real quick. So here I'm using two label, two, two different proteins that are fluorescently labeled. So in orange, I have labeled um, the cytoskeleton or the muscles of the cell. And in green is this protein we call zixin. It's green and it actually will label and find areas of the muscle which is under a cramp, so to speak. So if you watch this screen over here, this is where I overlay the two colors together and you can watch everything happen. So here you can see on occasion, you will have an area where a mus one, of, one of the muscles of the cells will have a little cramp and you can see this green protein come and say, oh, here's the cramp. And so I'm really, really interested in understanding, well, this protein knows where the cramp is and then later on, it actually knows how to teach, how to tell the cell to fix the cramp. And so I'm really interested in understanding how do you fix a cramp? How do you heal a cramp? And so one way of doing it is by using this powerful uh, light microscope to collect live cell images of movies of the cell making cramps and healing itself. Another powerful way of doing it is actually using, as Alice mentioned, um, this laser. Just like in Star Wars, you can shoot a laser through, through at a cell and cut it up. And by cutting it up, it's just like you imagining to create a little cramp in the cell. So we're going to now do that. And I'm going to show you um, actually live in live um, how we can cut up a cell to watch this little flash. Like right over here, you can see the screen pop up, how that can happen live. All right. So first off, I just want to make sure my cells are there. So this is my cell. This is part of a cell. It's way bigger than the screen as possible, but here it is. And just for fun, I'm going to show you green. Okay. So this is now this in green is, um, is Zixin, the protein I talked to you about earlier, the protein that labels where all the cramps are. And now I'm going to create a spot for where I want to um, create the cramp. And actually, I'm going to use, in this case, I'm going to use this one. So to make a cramp, all I have to do is say, you know, I really want to cut up, let's say, like this part of the cell. And I'll draw a little circle right here. And I'm going to make that the region where I want to cut the cell. And we'll go ahead and start cutting it up. So this is going to be image, and this is basically my control panel. It's like a big, like running a spaceship over here. So I'm about to start the, um, the laser ablation. And here you're going to watch. I'm going to overlay this together over here for everyone. You should be able to see yeah. that it starts to flash. I'm going to show that out real quick, OK? Oops, wrong one. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. It's all right. On. You can see probably in the left panel that there's like a dark hole where he hit it with a laser, very exciting. And you can see that that hole is getting bigger. So he clearly cut a hole in it. Yeah, so I'm going to I'm going to show you exactly where I, I uh, had cut it right right here, right. And actually, what's nice about this, is we can actually collect movies. So I can play this over and over again, and you can watch just as where I cut it, you can see that little orange spot go away. You start seeing the green should come up slowly. Sometimes the cramp is, so, sometimes I shoot it so hard that that, that cell realizes, oh my gosh, this cramp is so bad that I just can't, I can't <laughs> live with it anymore. I'm going to let my muscle go and say better luck another time. <laughs> so I can turn it up here and maybe you can see the cramp more. So you can see as I'm collecting, actually each movie here, we're playing over and over again because we're collecting every five seconds of the movie, of, of the cell, watching what happens. So sometimes it takes instantly a couple seconds. In this case, it's a bit small, but you can see in this case, it happens in the matter of probably 30 seconds. In 30 seconds, there's a cramp and the cell will, will notice where the cramp is. And I can cut it up and show where that cramp is showing. Smaller, but it's still noticeable in this case. That's so cool. Yep. And so, so I just have to interject here and say that where Jeannie says that 
she always knew that she wanted to be in science. I can't say that because I nearly became a professional musician. But I can say that the first time I looked through a fluorescence microscope, that was the point I knew that that is exactly what I wanted to do with my career. And so that's why I specialized in it. And the fun for me is that I get to work with all of these different people with all of these exciting projects who come in and use the microscopes to ask different questions. Sometimes I'll be imaging something once every 30 minutes for like a week at a time. And you won't see the result until the very end of it. So you have to be a very patient person. Well, sometimes you have something that's exciting, like what Donovan's doing here, where you just almost instantly see a result. And sometimes things change so quickly that we can hardly capture them on the cameras. And that's why we need faster and faster and more expensive cameras. How, how many times have you zoomed in on this, Donovan? What's the objective um, yeah, that yeah. you're using? So this, this is a 100, 100x objective. So it's 100 times more zoomed in. Um, and so you're, you're, you're basically, this 100x is probably the highest, one of the highest magnification, magnifications you can get for a light microscope. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really zoomed up. And so you can watch slowly over time. There's, there's a very light, but you're still noticeable. This over time as you can ablate the cell and I'll stop, I'll, I'll do a, one, a frame by frame for you guys. So you watch the circle, oops, it's going backwards. If you watch the frame, you can watch as I slowly ablate. As soon as I ablate, you can watch, you can watch the, any screen you want, oh, goes the wrong way. Watch any screen you want. As soon as you ablate, you can see that there's a, a spot where, oh, the, the stress fibers or the set of skeletons goes away, you get a big cramp. And as you do that, there's green that pops up right in that circle. And sometimes it's really small and sometimes it's really big. Um, and that's just basically on how big the cramp is and how the cell can begin to repair this cramp. Super cool. And are the, is this, uh, so we have a question around whether or not these cells are dead, but they are not dead, correct? No, no, you they're were looking alive. at them. They're alive. Yeah. yeah. They're super alive. They're, they're living their life on this glass, on a piece of glass, trying to figure out where they are. Cause we just, you know, yeah. we started shooting it with lasers. Like, oh my gosh, what's happening? Now, yeah. you're, now you're making me like not be able to walk. What's wrong? You know? And so, <laughs> yeah. um, it's, it's right now just trying to figure its life out. But yeah, we do this all the time. And and that's the power of the light microscope. You can actually watch live what, what is happening, um, you know, over seconds of, of, a, of the time scale, um, whether it's getting a cramp or not, how you can repair the cramp and so forth. So here we're looking at cells. We have other microscopes where we actually look at all living organisms. Um, you can even have, we have one where you can even just shave out a little bit of the brain, like the, the mouse, the, the um, skull, and I've got a little glass window there. And you can watch what's going on in the neurons of these mice. And they're, they're alive, it's fine. It's just like one of us having an operation. So these techniques can be pretty non-invasive. And they're, they're being used more and more as well by doctors in medicine. Particularly if you can have fiber optic ways of delivering the light. If you can imagine, for example, if you're trying to cut out tumors and you want to see whether you've got the whole tumor out, wouldn't it be much better if you could just look straight away in the person use a press light to target it and see whether you've got out all the edges of it. So these are the kind of tools that are being developed now. So there's a whole range of different microscopes that we have here. Ones that are used for bacteria, ones that are used for whole um, zebra fish or worms, um, ones that are used for cells, and every one requires its own specific setup. They're all slightly different from each other. We have around 18 of them and they range from about $100,000 to just over a million dollars. Amazing. And bringing up more and more absolutely gorgeous pictures too. I know, Honestly, here you can watch. I can't be for my microscopists. I know, we, we love watching these movies over and over again, but I just want to show one last one where you can watch this region right here where I can, where I can again, use a laser to shoot and cut up a cell. And you can watch how this, this happens. The cramp happens here, and then you can see that big flash of green, right? Ooh. And like watch all these other things happening and watch you know, this other large part of the muscle fusing with each other as, a, as you have cramps. So that's the power of line record. You can see so much happening at one time and you know exactly what you're looking at because you label or you specifically color your protein of interest. So that's what I study. I, I study how, how cells make cramps and how we can heal these cramps. Awesome. Thank you. These are, this is super cool. Thank you so much both. All right. Um, we need to move on. Yeah, yeah. Let's get let's let's 
Thanks. The light microscopes are awesome. I'll never forget um, having Allison teach me to use some of the microscopes in my studies and how there was one time I was able to take my cells and put them in this chamber so that the temperature was kept, um, you know, at the right temperature and the, the right carbon dioxide level was sort of maintained. And I was able to watch and set up movies of my cells to learn about how things were taking place over time. And looking through that microscope was some of the coolest things I've, I've ever seen in my life. Um, so thank you so much. And we'll, we'll come back to you both in a little bit, but we're gonna head on over to the cryo-EM facility to say hello. So um, Johanna and Han Kit, please join us today, turn on, turning on your videos and to say hello. We're so excited to have our next stop be the Evelyn Gruss Lipper Cryo Electron Microscopy Resource Center. I am so pleased to introduce you to our expert, Johanna Sotiris and Hong Kit Ng, who help run the center. They have put together a video about the big, powerful microscopes and how they operate. But before we see that video, tell us how you're doing today, both. Oh, well, thank you. It's, uh, it's a rainy Saturday, but we're happy to be here. <laughs> awesome. Yep, doing and I great. See, great, and you both are donning your tie-dye yep. as yes, per Science Saturday. Yes, so Science Saturday, we all wear tie-dye shirts, and that's how you can identify the scientists. So hopefully you'll see us next time on campus. Um, so, all right, I need to know. We talked a little bit about like what we saw and how awesome those things you know, seeing things under light microscopes, right? And you work with a different kind of microscope. But I want to know, you must have had experience with microscope for years. What is the coolest thing you have ever seen under a microscope? Johanna, why don't you tell us first? Sure, yeah. Well, um, I would have to say um, it was using a, a scanning electron microscope, which is um, a dip, well, a different type of electron microscope than what we use here, which are transmission electron microscopes. And we use this microscope to look at a zebrafish. And the zebrafish, we actually zoomed in inside the ear canal of the zebrafish, and we visualized tiny, tiny, tiny little hair follicles inside the ear canal. And I thought that was amazing. Wow. Um, that was one of my most memorable experiences using these microscopes. Cool. I'm getting goosebumps. That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Hankin? Uh, for me, it was also scanning like my true microscope. I'm oh, sorry, scanning electron microscope. Um, but it w instead of saying biological, it was actually graphite. So the stuff that we use to make our uh, pencils, it looks very solid to, to our naked eye, at least. Um, but when you look at it under an electron microscope, you see all the striations, all of the little imperfections that kind of cause it to be such a good writing utensil. Like it just flakes off onto the paper. Um, I thought that was really cool. There were a lot of like really small little, like not really crystals, but like balls of, uh, of graphite and other striations that just look really cool. That sounds awesome. Mm -hmm. All right, I have one extremely serious question. I really need you to get into a serious mindset. Okay. What is your favorite ice cream flavor? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a bit of a traditional person. I like chocolate and I'll stick to that. <laughs> yeah, purist. <laughs> How about you, Hunkit? Uh, for me, it would be um, probably uh, chocolate chip cookie dough. It's oh yeah, mine's, that's yeah, a good one. Of my favorite <laughs> treat, so. Yeah, God, I remember when that. cookie dough was introduced to the world and it yep. changed my life, yes. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Great, well, I think um, these were very important introductions that we had to share with our audience before moving in, um, but <laughs> let's, uh, <laughs> What are we going to take a look at now, Johanna? Do you want to just tell us a quick uh, introduction of, of what we're about to see? Absolutely, yes. So this is a mini tour of our facility here at the Cryolectron Microscopy Research Center. We're going to see our transmission electron microscopes and our newest addition, which is will be introduced by Hankit, um, our focused ion beam uh, electron microscope. And um, we also have some cryo, um, uh, light microscopy uh, capabilities as well. So please cool. enjoy. Cool, awesome. All right, well, let's, let's take a look at the video. Welcome to the Cryo Electron Microscopy Resource Center. Our facility has three transmission electron microscopes, 
a 200,000 volt Talos Arctica, seen here, and two 300,000 volt Titan Cryosis, seen here. What is a transmission electron microscope? A TEM is built similarly as a light microscope. If you look at this figure, you see for both systems, there is an illumination source, a stage where the sample sits, and a series of lenses that focus, magnify, and project an image. But in the case of the TEM, the illumination source are electrons and not photons. And instead of glass lenses, the TEM has electromagnetic lenses. Why do we use electrons and not photons? Think about what the human eye can resolve. That means, how close can two objects be to each other and still be able to distinguish them from one another? So let's say the human eye can resolve objects separated by 0.2 millimeters. Conventional light microscope can resolve objects separated by 0.0002 millimeters or 200 nanometers. The electron microscope can resolve objects separated by, look at so many zeros. In our case, that's close to two angstroms. That's the unit of measurement we use in electron microscopy. This is very important in determining the structure of small molecules, such as proteins, because if we can resolve objects separated by only two angstroms, we can actually resolve the atoms of a molecule. What makes electrons so good at resolving atoms and molecules? Well, electrons are very, very small, thousands of times smaller than atoms. Electrons can also behave like waves, just like photons do, and they have wavelengths. And depending on what speed the electrons are moving, which is dependent on what we call the accelerating voltage of the microscope, the electron wavelengths can be made very small, making their resolving power much better. Let's take a closer look inside the microscope. This is our electron gun. This is where the electrons are extracted from a special metal filament and then accelerated down the column. This is our camera, an extremely sensitive image sensor. It is sensitive enough to detect individual electrons. When an electron hits the sensor, the signal it produces is read out to form an image. This is where we load our samples, and we can load up to 12 samples at a time. There's a robotic arm that manipulates the grid and loads it onto the stage. The microscope, although large and heavy, is very sensitive to vibrations. Therefore, it sits on an anti-vibration table, which isolates it from any environmental disturbances. This is our high-tension tank. This is where we produce the high voltage needed to accelerate the electrons close to the speed of light. The microscope needs to be under vacuum. Otherwise, the electron beam would be disrupted by air molecules. The system also has to be very cold. That's why we use liquid nitrogen to cool it down to minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit. This is to protect our sample from radiation damage caused by high energy electrons. Let's take a closer look at how we prepare these samples. Our microscopes are very large, measuring up to 13 feet tall, but our sample that goes into the microscope must be very small, just three millimeters in diameter. I'm preparing the grid for freezing by securing it onto fine tipped tweezers that will be secured onto our grid plunger. We use liquid ethane as our coolant. Our sample volume is also very small, only three microliters. The sample is in a solution that contains hundreds of thousands of identical copies of protein molecules. We add the protein solution onto the grid. But even three microliters is too much for the microscope. So using special papers, we wick off about 97% of the solution and leave a very thin film of sample onto the grid. This thin film of sample is flash frozen in liquid ethane and forms a glass-like frozen layer in which the protein particles are frozen in different orientations. Here is a schematic enlargement of what the grid looks like. It is divided by hundreds of little squares and each square has a thin layer of carbon support film and arranged in a matrix are 1.2 micron diameter holes that are empty. Inside these holes, our sample is frozen. The frozen grids are too thin and vulnerable to be loaded directly into the microscope. So before we load them, we assemble them into what we call a cartridge. The cartridge consists of three parts, the ring, the grid, and a C-clip, seen here. This is our cassette. It can fit up to 12 cartridges. Everything is under liquid nitrogen. We do not want our sample to melt at any point. The cassette is then transferred into a pre-cooled capsule. 
Now we're ready to take our samples to the microscope. Now we're docking the capsule onto the autoloader. A valve opens and a mechanical arm goes into the capsule and grabs the cassette. You can see some liquid nitrogen being displaced. The arm goes back up and the valve closes and the capsule is released. The technique we use is called single particle analysis. We collect thousands of 2D images of the protein molecules caught in different orientations. A sophisticated computer algorithm stitches the images together to reveal a three-dimensional structure. Now we're going to hear from Honkit. This protein looks big, but in reality it is about 6,000 times smaller than the thickness of a hair. There are millions of proteins like these in a cell, but what if you want to see directly inside the cell to find this protein? These microscopes cannot do this because cells are way too thick for electrons to pass through them. So to get around this, we can cut the cells using another microscope. To start, cells are frozen on a grid and taken to a fluorescent microscope. We start by cooling down the transfer station and loading our grids onto a shuttle, which we put inside of the scope. This microscope uses light, not electrons, to look inside the cell. The proteins we're interested in are marked with tiny tags that glow under certain light conditions. And we can use this information to tell us where we should be cutting the cell. Each glowing green dot is the location of our protein. After these locations are marked, we can load them into the actual cutting microscope. To do this, we have to cool down another transfer station and load the grids onto another shuttle to put inside of the scope. This time, the microscope is an electron microscope with an ion beam attached. The ion beam is similar to a very powerful laser, and we will use this to cut the cells to make them thin enough for us to see inside. Using locations we got from the fluorescence microscope, we can target the areas where a protein is located and cut thin sideways slices of the cell. After everything is set up, we start the ion beam and watch as the cell melts away until there is only a thin layer left. This video is sped up, but this process can take up to an hour to complete and has to be done at least four or more times to get them to be thin enough. This mound is the front view of a cell before we cut it. And here is the cell after we cut it, leaving only a thin piece of cellular material at the center of the cell. Once the cells are cut, we will take the grids to the transmission electron microscopes and take images of the cell. And that's it. Hopefully you all enjoyed our presentation on these different types of microscopes. Thank you so much, Johanna and Han Kid. I think we are now going to be joined by Allison and Donovan and start getting to everybody's questions. Um, we have a bunch of questions coming in through the chat. We also have some questions that were submitted uh, upon registration and I think that they are great. So thank you everybody. Um, anybody who continues developing a question throughout this discussion, please feel free to drop it into the Q&A. Um, all right, so let's get started. Uh, I think maybe this question could be good for Johanna, since you work with such a, uh, with a microscope with such a high resolution. We have a question from Ilya and they wonder, what is the smallest object you can see with a microscope? Well, uh, that would be atoms. Um, mm. uh, Actually, we have a special sample that we load onto our microscope, and we use that to fine tune the microscope before we start a session. And um, it's sputtered or covered with gold um, particles. And um, we can actually resolve gold atoms using these microscopes. Unfortunately, we cannot do that with biological samples because they are sensitive to radiation. Um, and uh, when we image them, we produce um, noisier images uh, that are not as uh, clear as, let's say, looking at old atoms, but we can resolve atoms. And following up on that, uh, maybe Hunkit, you can tell us um, a little bit about why everything has to be frozen when you're working with your samples. And this is a, a question that we got recently uh, from Hassini. 
Yeah, so relating back to what Johanna said, um, well, one of the things about biological samples is they need, they need to be in this sort of like aqueous solution. So the ice actually preserves that uh, solution the, when they were alive. Um, so when we put them actually in the microscopes, uh, because the microscopes are electron microscopes, they need to be in vacuum. So it's used to sort of seal everything in place, sort of like a resin, so that nothing really changes when you put them in the scope. Um, on top of that, when, when, you, when the electrons actually come down, um, it can cause a lot of radiation damage to the actual cells. The ice is there as a, sort of like a buffer to prevent some of that. Otherwise, it would just all melt away and get destroyed. Yeah, awesome. electron, electrons act like um, they're very high energy. So uh, when you go to the dentist and they take x-rays of your teeth, you have to wear a shield um, on your chest, right? Because x-rays can be damaging to your cells. So electrons behave similarly um, as x-rays, very high energy and can be dangerous to biological material. Yeah, electrons are fascinating and it's amazing yeah. that scientists have been able to harness them uh, as a tool for visualization. So cool. Um, Allison, I'd love to ask you some questions about light microscopes. And we have this great question from Iwana who wonders if the light microscopes that you showed, your, your amazing fluorescent microscope, is that similar in principle to what a student might see in a light microscope in their schools? And how might that differ if it is different? So the kind of microscopes that you have in your schools are probably not fluorescent microscopes because the fluorescent sources of light and the cameras and so on and the lasers, whatever, they're very, very expensive. So in general, what you'll be using in a regular microscope in your schools is using white light, like almost like, you know, daylight almost. And, and so in that case, there are other techniques that you can use to impart contrast to your object. Remember I said that you need to have contrast, like you can't see white against white, right? Or black against black, mm -hmm. you need to have some kind of contrast. So there are ways of um, manipulating the, the light waves going through to change the phase of the light or um, the wave paths or whatever, so that you can do these fancy ways to impart contrast within the cells, or you can stain them. There are stains that you can put on, like hematoxylin and eosin is a classic stain that pathologists use to stain tissue samples so they can see what kind of tissue. You're looking at blood vessels or, or, um, or all kinds of things, or maybe you'll look at a slice of um, plant tissue, which already maybe has some color in it or whatever. So mm -hmm. in general, you're just using bright field light in, in, the, in, in the lab, but we use those techniques as well. And that's important to explain because those techniques are the gentlest on cells. So just in the way that electrons can harm tissues and cells, these high power lasers can as well. And some of the microscopes we have, the, the, laser, the lasers are such high power that it's, it's like if you're standing in Australia under the sunlight at one o'clock in the afternoon and you don't have sunscreen on, right? You're gonna start burning. So the same way the cells will start burning. So, so just using normal white light can actually be much gentler on the cells and it can be very, very useful. And we saw an example of that, Donovan, right? You, you used a high powered laser to cut a section of the cell and you call that cutting ablation. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, where you got, what were those cells and how did you get them in the first place? Yeah, yeah. So those are actually called, the, the technical name is, they're called mouse embryonic fibroblasts. So they actually came from a mouse um, and actually when they were in the embryo stage. So before they came out of the womb, you, you call them an embryo. And um, these cells were harvested from an embryo of a mouse many, 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 many years ago. Um, and in this case, the ones I showed you uh, were harvested by one of our collaborators. Um, and, and actually, uh, this specific one, we made sure to delete a certain gene so that uh, we could re-express it ourselves. So um, if you heard of like CRISPR or some sort of like gene editing techniques, that's what we used or they had used to make sure our mouse embryonic fibroblasts, these, these cells that you're looking at, didn't have the gene that we re-expressed in green, so to speak. Awesome. And I think, you know, Allison and Johanna, as sort of people who are working with scientists all the time, um, can you tell us about, there's a question on how many scientists are using microscopes at Rockefeller, right? And I think the number is a lot. 
right? So, yeah. uh, Allison, for example, how many people are using your facility? I'm going to win there, basis? I know. I know my <laughs> centers use more than any of the other centers at the university. So there are about 75 laboratories at the university, let's say. And I think out mm -hmm. of those 75 laboratories, about 70 use my facility. And then we also have about 35 laboratories from institutions all around New York and uh, Connecticut, New Jersey. We've had people coming up from Baltimore. So some of our pieces of equipment are so specialized that people will travel a long way to come to use them. And uh, those ones in particular are what I referred to, the one we were using the super resolution instrument. So I did, I actually did want to expand on that because um, I have to stand up for light microscopy. What Johanna showed was absolutely true that a standard, a standard light microscopy can only image down to about um, 200 nanometers, we'd say 0.2 micrometers. But actually the very latest super resolution microscopes can go down to about two nanometers. So they're actually wow. now a hundred times higher resolution than they used to be. So now we're talking two nanometers for light microscopy and maybe 0.2 for electron microscopy. We're catching you up, Johanna. We're getting there. <laughs> That's good. Battle of the microscopy. <laughs> this rivalry, guys. Yeah, absolutely. Fun. <laughs> yeah. So, Johanna, about how many people are, are using, and, and speaking of specialty microscopes, you also have a couple of special microscopes in, in your facility, right? Uh, there's only, there's a few, few of them uh, in the right. world. Right, so, right. Right, yes. So our transmission electron microscopes, the ones seen behind me here, the um, Titan Cryuses, I would say there are about 450 in, 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 the, in the world, uh, which is a very small number. But uh, here in New York City, we have quite a few of them. Uh, so it's a big hub for cryo right. um, And again, our, user ba our users um, are not, and anywhere close to the number that Allison mentioned, but we do have uh, quite a few scientists here at Rockefeller, exclusively only Rockefeller scientists use our microscopes and, and they're in high demand, of course, because uh, it's, um, it's such a great tool. Yeah, they're, they're both. I mean, these are incredible things. And to see the, I once went into the cryo EM facility and saw the atom of gold. And I was like, this is the most amazing thing, you know, and it was, yeah. Yeah. And Adam, you know, yeah. like who, I felt very mm -hmm. privileged in, in seeing that. Um, and I think so, the coolest things that I've learned in terms of the differences, uh, well, well, let's talk about the similarities of your microscopes. You, you both have illumination energies, right? And in the cryo EM case, it, the, that illumination energy is electrons. And in the light microscope case, that illumination energy is photons, right? And both of them have lenses to help manipulate the, 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 light, the illumination sources so that you can focus on a sample. But the cool thing that I learned is that the, mat, uh, the ugh, I almost gave away the answer, but the, <laughs> the lenses um, for each type of microscope are different. And I'd love for um, maybe folks to talk a little bit about why that is. So uh, I don't know if anybody feels really like compelled to discuss lenses and illumination energy, but I'd love to hear it. Uh, sure, um, yeah. Um, the, well, the electron microscope does uses elect electromagnetic lenses, as we call it. Uh, they're basically just uh, coils of metal um, that can be uh, elect um, electromagnetically, electrically and magnetically manipulated. Um, so that they uh, in turn manipulate the electron beam. Um, and this was discovered in the early 1920s that electrons can be behave like waves, like photons. Um, and using these special coiled uh, electromagnetic lenses, uh, that beam can be uh, focused into, um, or can the path of that beam can be manipulated so that it can act like a, um, a light source. Um, so yeah, that's the difference that I could, my expertise, I guess I could explain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Johanna, and, Johanna wins there on coolness of lenses, but um, mm -hmm. the lenses inside a light microscope are made of glass. 
but they're very complicated. Um, actually, one thing I did have to show you, which I think is cool, and I think there was another question in there about early microscopes. So I did want to show you this. This is a replica of one of the earliest microscopes, the Van Leeuwenhoek microscope, which was designed in about 1600. And what you do is you stick your sample on that little pin sticking up there like a fly. And then there's one glass lens here behind it. And you just look through this glass lens and you can see, and it's amazing the details that they could find just with this one simple little microscope. So that's like the most basic thing from around, as I say, from around 1600. And these were developed mainly by um, spectacle makers in the Netherlands and in Germany. Um, so we hand over to the Netherlands here, which is where Johanna's coming from that part of the world. Um, but nowadays, the lenses that we use, because the trouble is if you're doing multiple wavelengths of light, it's hard to bring them all into focus in the same position. And, and so the objective lenses under a microscope look more like this, but inside mm. one of these lenses, there's maybe 10 different pairs or triplets of glass lenses that are a different shape. Some of them are convex, some of them are concave, and they're all brought in together in order to minimize what we would call these aberrations or distortions of the different colors as they're going through. I'm sure Johanna's lenses also have many ways of correcting for these mm -hmm. aberrations. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Correct. And 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 just to clarify, um, Oh, uh, also, before I move into the next question, I also want to point out my background here. This is a Science Saturday that we did about, I think this is from 2018, um, where we had a room and had folks build the open sourced microscope. These are called fold scopes. And it's paper and lenses that are sort of origami together. Yes, there it is. There's the fold scope. So um, for folks who are interested in doing this kind of thing at home in sort of the the sort of the older uh, traditional way of the closer, I would say it's a little bit more modern than the 1600s, but the ease and portability is probably the same. So I definitely recommend checking out these devices. Um, we do have a question on um, color versus black and white. So Donovan and Allison, when you're using fluorescent microscopy, we can obviously see color, but is it, are we seeing color or are you adding color? Through compute, like through the computer. Do you want to go for it, Donovan? Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, so generally, when we're using fluorescence, um, yes, we actually are seeing color in a very specific wavelength. Uh, but sometimes it's a little easier if we change the colors to make it easier for our eyes to see. So sometimes, you know, it's we're, we're uh, the thing we're fluorescing is actually dark blue or something or in dark blue or a blue is might be really hard for my eyes to see against a black background. But if I, if I change the color on my computer to say it's like white, it's a lot more clear. That's called contrast. So the contrast is much better and you can have a better idea of, this, of the structures of things you're seeing inside a cell. So generally, yes, but you can also just use white light and it's like then just, you know, there's no color. But it is also important to realize that about 95% of the cameras that we use on these fluorescence microscope are black and white cameras. So it is a very good question. We're taking real color. Real color is coming out of the, of the specimen, but then we're capturing it on a black and white camera, and then we are pseudo coloring that back again to whatever color we want. Um, and many people don't realize that, including many of the professors here, but don't let them hear I said that. Um, but, and your eyes are actually much more sensitive to perceiving differences in black and white than in color. So that's actually, we try and encourage people to display their images in black and white, because then you can really see fine differences in the intensities, which you can't see, particularly as Donovan was saying, if it's something in blue, which is we're not good at perceiving differences there. But the truth is everybody likes color, right? It's prettier. So they always want to show it in color in the end anyway. So that's what tends to happen. Now, Hunkit, you don't necessarily have this problem, right? Because things are always black and white for you. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, because yeah. we're counting electrons. So the way that our detectors work, they, they would actually count the number of electrons that are entering the, the camera and using um, some computer software, it would try to convert that into pixels, pixel values. So for us, it's the value between zero and, you know, whatever the highest value we use based on the dose. All right, so we have um, probably time for maybe one or two questions. There's a bunch of questions out there on how expensive 
are microscopes. I will say these fold scopes are like one dollar, right? Let's start <laughs> at the one dollar. <laughs> so, Allison, tell us how much you know the general microscope that you use are, uh, you know, in in your facility. Yeah, so most of the microscopes in my facility would come in the range of a hundred to five hundred thousand, and then I have three or four that are closer to a million. And there's one that I, the one that can image something that's two nanometers in size, that would cost me 2 million. So I don't have one of those yet. <laughs> and Johanna, what, what are the costs of, of your Titan and other microscopes? Um, well, ours range between um, a, a million to 10 million. Um, wow. our, our big ones back here are closer to 10 million. Um, so yes, very expensive. <laughs> Extremely. Mm -hmm. um, well, I would love to end. Uh, I did not actually, we learned what Honkit and Johanna's coolest thing that I ever saw under <laughs> a microscope. So I would love to hear that answer from Allison and Donovan. What is the coolest thing you've ever seen under a microscope? Uh, I, I, can, I can start first real quick. Yeah. Um, so actually I think the coolest one, maybe make, make sure my boss is not here. No, I'm kidding. Um, so the coolest <laughs> thing I, I've seen, um, the coolest thing I, I've seen in, under a microscope would, would be actually uh, these cells are really cool. But actually, seeing um, chicken skin cells. Um, so I, before you know joining this lab that I work in, I, I worked on studying a little for a little bit, understanding how like your how your how chickens make feathers basically, um, wow. and and so we basically use the same idea. We can put chicken skin cells. We can harvest them from the chicken. And then watch how they form into shapes that would resemble what a follicle would be like. So the, the bud where your hair would come out or the feather would come out. And it was so cool watching through lifestyle imaging um, how, how these cells move and form and make these crazy like patterns and shape. Um, so chicken skin cells is probably the coolest thing I've seen under a microscope. I never would have guessed chicken skin cells be the answer to, your, to this question, but that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and Allison, what is the coolest thing that you've ever seen under a microscope? I'm really struggling here. I, I I can't think of one. I really can't because there's so many. I mean, and I particularly love weird things. I love looking at bacteria and yeast and mm. fungus and all of these funky things rather than just cells. But I can't hone down on one coolest thing. I think I mean the thing that the things that stick in my memory the most are actually things that I've looked at for years in regular fluorescent microscopes. And then we bought the super resolution systems. And suddenly you're looking at a bac bacteria, say, which would mm -hmm. just be like a little tiny round blob, even at 100x in a regular microscope. And then you look at them in the super resolution and you can see all these details within it. And you know, sometimes you know that you're the first person who has ever seen that level of detail mm. in this specimen because you've got the first one of these microscopes. And I'm sure Johanna's and the Hong Kid have had, and have had exactly the same experience that it's like, you know, you're like, oh yeah, this is a really cool thing. Oh my gosh, what the heck is that? I've never seen that before. <laughs> and literally sometimes you're jumping off your chair and I've had some of the professors just jumping off their chair saying, I never knew it looked like that. So, I, but I'm sorry, I just can't think of just one. There's too many cool. I, I am particularly I think fond, that's though. fair I will admit I'm particularly fond still of tardigrades little water bears oh. I mean who could ever get over watching They're little so water cute. bears running around with their little fists <laughs> yeah <laughs> I feel that well I want to take an offer this opportunity to thank you Allison Donovan Johanna and Hankit this has been such a fantastic session and it has been so much fun to visit your labs virtually. And I also want thank, to thank all of you in the audience for your terrific questions and for joining us on a Saturday morning to explore science at Rockefeller. We hope you had fun, I sure did. And we are especially grateful for the Andrea C. Dracopoulos Family Science and Society Initiative for their generous support of two Rockefeller's science outreach programs, Science Saturday and Talking Science, which is a program for high school students offered in January. Thank you again for joining us. 